Good afternoon, everyone. Genesis chapter 2, please. We'll reread our scripture and see what the Lord has for us this afternoon. I have a lot of different verses rattling around in my empty skull, and I trust the Lord will help us that he might have his way in this message this afternoon. I feel like he, like he did this morning. We're looking at a river went out in Genesis 2.10. We're talking about the river being the person of God as he was encased in, as Song of Solomon chapter 4 and verse 12 said, encased in a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. And so here he is prior to creation and prior to uh, him manifesting himself in the world. As we see the number four represents the world and there'll be four rivers after this. Uh, we are seeing him, as Jesus said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. This spake he of the Spirit. So we're trying to see what God would have for us in this. Genesis 2, we'll begin reading with verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden. Wouldn't you like to see that? Stooping over and punching a hole in the dirt and sticking a plant in there or a seed or whatever. And the Lord God planted a garden. What you doing, Lord? I'm planting a garden. What you going to make man to be? A gardener. Ain't that good? We get to do what he does. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. The first Adam was in a garden here and the beauty and the perfection of it. The last Adam was in a garden with sweat on his brow as great drops of blood. Mm. The first Adam caused briars and thorns to come up that hadn't been planted except by the droppings of his sin into the earth. In the last Adam, he cleansed the earth by wearing the thorns as a crown upon his own head. He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might have the righteousness of God in him, and we could go back into the garden and be one with the Lord, and Jesus not be mad at us for doing what we did to him. Isn't that good? And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and that is good for food. The tree of life also, because it was not supposed to be eaten. So it adds these, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, a river went out of Eden to water the garden. What was the name of the river? I don't know. Was it a small creek or branch? No, it was a river. That's amazing. A, a river that never shall run dry. Abraham had two sons. One was named Ishmael, and he got thrown out of the camp with Hagar, his mama, with his water in a bottle. He was Abraham's son, no doubt about it. There's a lot of religionists today just have their water in a bottle. But that will run out. But he had another son named Isaac. And that fellow was digging wells everywhere he went. He must have taught his son Jacob to do it too because when Jesus sat down by the well in John chapter 4, the woman said, our father Jacob dug this well. And it stayed around till Jesus could drink out of it. Whew. Excuse me a minute. Man, ain't that something? That never shall run dry. Isn't that what you led us in singing? That never shall run dry. I hope we don't have water in a bottle. A memorized th theology. Or just instant God when we want to, you know, bring him out and use him but be overcome by the vastness of the glory of God and, and be mollified. If, if, if a wound or sore gets 
stiff and hard and dry. You, it won't get well. And it said that, that her, her wounds were not at all mollified. They wasn't softened by moisture. And I thank God today that Jesus Christ takes care of all of our needs, even to the wounds of sin and wounds of Satan and the mistakes we made. And we can go to him who told us to give, forgive 70 times 7. And he himself said, well, my mercy endureth forever. And I can go back and get my wounds cleansed by the river that never shall run dry. How many rivers were in Egypt, in Eden, excuse me, in Eden? One. The Lord thy God is one Lord. What does the river do in Eden? It waters the garden. And then when it goes out and it reaches the city limit sign, what happens? From thence it was parted and, be and became into four heads. Now we already see something about the river in Eden by beginning to look at these that were out of Eden. First of all, it was singular. There's just one Lord. There's no other name given among men under heaven whereby you must be saved. The Lord thy God is one Lord. And it had a singular purpose, watering the garden. And then from thence it was parted. Now we see that the invisible things of his person are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. The invisible things of his person, his glory, his holiness, his mercy, his wisdom, his long-suffering. Oh, what a great God we have. And we can see these things by the things that are made. Look at the river. Tell me something about God. Don't tell me about how many gallons of water will flow by in so many minutes. Tell me something about God. That's what it was created for. And from thence, once you leave the garden, from thence it was parted. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. What would you do if you had no other individual to talk to ever? One of our sisters just came flying in here, landed at the big airport in Atlanta. And sometimes on an airplane, I guess I can still call them that without my grandchildren correcting me. I still say airplane. I know Delta says the equipment. You can have a plane full of people and nobody to talk to. What do you do? What if you had never, ever, 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 and never would ever have anybody else, any other human being, any other person to commune with? Could you live within the consciousness of yourself never being able to express yourself and the things that you think good of yourself, you could never tell them to another soul. Proverbs chapter 8. Verse 23, verse 22. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I don't know, where do we start? 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. This is wisdom talking, and in wisdom we know in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 is Christ. When there were no depths, I was set up from everlasting from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, just one river, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth, yea, as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the earth. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, 
when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was won by him as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of the earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Before Abraham was, Jesus said in John 8, I think it's 56, before Abraham was, I am. There was a point, I don't know how to say it, I know that you can't say time, there was no time. There was a point when there was nothing but the Trinity. And the scriptures say in him is light and in him is no darkness at all. I saw Miss Ann delivering her cackleberries to Sister Karen to today. You don't know what a cackleberry is. It's an egg. And I think about the egg having the life within it. And if God don't mind, and I've tried this before and he didn't seem to reprimand me. Think of God as an egg of light in the vastness of nothingness. He didn't dwell in the vastness of darkness. There wasn't no darkness yet. He had not penetrated the egg yet and come out to contrast light with darkness. So here he is as this perfectly illuminated and illuminating egg, just God. But that was God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There was nobody else to talk to. There was nobody outside themselves to speak to. There was nobody that they could show the wonderful works of God. He didn't have an object of guilt, so he couldn't show mercy. Mercy is strictly for the guilty. There's nobody guilty, yet he can't show mercy. So he was perfectly happy and satisfied within himself, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the essence of his glory, communing with himself. But Brother Bobby read us this morning in Ephesians chapter 1 that we were chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world. So this did not exclude God's elect because where were we elected? Where were we elected? In Christ. So this is God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit and all of God's intended elect prior to the river touching the city limits. Dear friend, God is perfectly happy in himself. He's perfectly satisfied in himself. He's perfectly content in himself. And he tells us, be still and know that I am God. Now, it takes children a long time to learn how to be still. Some of us children haven't learned how to be still yet. But godliness with contentment is great gain. And sometimes people who see a saint of God silently, quietly, meditating... Maybe his Bible or her Bible is in their lap, but they cease to read it because the Word has come to speak to them now and they have been taken away from the Scriptures. And the vastness of God's glory and the sweetness of God's unction and the anointing of God's Spirit and the revelation of the person of Christ is saturating them in His glory. And others cannot know and do not understand and do not perceive. And others think, especially children, if you're not talking to me, you really are not living. You know, you, children always want your attention. They can't stand it if they don't have your attention. But adults can, after the rest have gone their way, go back over there to the coffee pot and get a second cup. Go sit down in the bay window and not see anything but look out. 
and just sit there in the sweetness and the quietness and the stillness of the awareness of the glory of God. And ignorant religionists say, what shall we do in heaven? I can't believe that question. It's not a matter of doing. It's a matter of being in God and contemplating the vastness of his glory. Shall you ever reach the depth of the height of the breadth of the width? No. It's not a matter of doing because what you thought you were going to have was an eternal vacation and Jesus was going to be the captain of the shuffleboard up on the poop deck, you know, and you're going to be entertained all the time. The river went out. Before it went out, it was encased in the enclosed garden in Psalm 4, 12. My sister, my spouse, she is like a garden enclosed with the fountain of waters there to supply what, what all she needs. And here we have God manifesting himself in his essence prior to creation. And he does not come to diversify and manifest himself through things until it says in verse 10 of Genesis 2, And from thence, after it had watered the garden, after it was a singular unnamed river, that's first. And from thence, it was parted. There's a multiplicity of the revelation of God. Everything in existence speaks of God. Everything in the scriptures is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And from thence it is parted. And now it goes into four different rivers. Four is the number of the world. There are four winds that blow. There are four directions, north, south, east, and west. It's the number for the world. And so as he comes into the world, instead of the I don't know how to say it, concentrate, yet to be diluted into four. He can't manifest himself, does not choose to manifest himself to creation in that way. He comes to part himself and to go in the different directions with rivers now that each and every one of them has a name. Why are you brought to think about the river in, God, in the Garden of Eden as not having a name? Because as soon as he gets out, he's got four names. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, it had four names out here. How come he didn't have one name in there? He said, no. Oh. Pause and think about that. Who shall I say? I am that I am. You didn't say Adonai? No. Nope. You didn't say Elohim? No. Nope. You didn't say El Shaddai? No. I want Moses to know that I am what I am. Therefore, I can only be known in myself. And I know who I am, and I'm perfectly satisfied with myself. But as it progresses, and God goes out to his creation in the world, he parts into four different directions and gives himself four different names. There are two of these names in verse 14. Hidekel or Hidekel is the Tigris River. Daniel 10, 4 will tell you that. And the fourth river is Euphrates. So we understand that somewhere around the Tigris and Euphrates was the cradle of civilization. But Dr. Bottle Stoppers all have different ideas about Gahan and Havilah in verses 11 and verse 13. And it is said that they don't know exactly who, where these rivers are or what their status is today. They can't really find them. And if you were to find all four of these rivers, you will not find them coming from one source. 
We read 2 Peter 3, 6 this morning, and it said, The world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The world doesn't exist anymore. God still exists. He's still the singular unnamed river. Although we know his name because to know him is salvation. This is eternal life that they may know thee. And we turn over to the end of the book in Revelation 22. And we find him again. At the end of the age. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. And the Spirit of God is going to show John the bride. And it says in Revelation 22 and verse number 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. I don't know if they've ever found out yet. I don't know. I, I haven't kept up with it. But years ago, I studied and found out that the Nile River was, that was difficult for them to know what the source was. They may already have learned. I don't know. But... The source of God is God. He didn't have to get here to be here. He was already here before he got here. From everlasting to everlasting, I am God. God doesn't just have eternal life. He has everlasting life. He always has been, and he always will be. It proceeds out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. Why? But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. What did we learn about Christ's humanity in Second Corinthians chapter 5? Verses 15 through 17 this morning. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth shall we know him no more. There started being a brand new creation. And I don't need to see Jesus physically. I don't want pictures of Buffalo Bill without his guns in my Bible, holding some little child with an angel standing behind him and say, that's Jesus. No, the Holy Ghost reveals God to me in my heart. And I have learned to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I have learned that I should do that, but I haven't got it all done yet. But I'm working on it because I am refusing to think a single thought in my mind that I don't reveal to Christ. You say, I can't do that. Sometimes I have some really wicked thoughts judging in my mind. Tell it to Jesus. Well, I'd be embarrassed to say that. Well, he already knows it. What are you going to do? Sew fig leaves together and go hide? I don't want to lose his presence. I don't want to have to hide because the devil in my flesh let those wicked thoughts in my mind. I don't want you to steal from me a single millisecond of my opportunity to be with him because, Brother Kenny, if he is not to be found, how tedious, te say it. What he said. It's a tasteless time. It's very tedious 
not to have the Lord. So I'm going to bring everything that I know of as my self-consciousness into the presence of God. Bring it in saying, I'm sorry to drag this in before you. But I, I will not go running from you and try to hide. I want Christ completely and wholly. Not H-O-L-Y only, but W-H-O-L-L-Y. I want him fully. I don't want to ever be without him. And that's the way you can get rid of the devil and, and shame your flesh. And strengthen your spiritual man. Say, all right, you two. Every time you bring anything into my mind, I'm going to tell Jesus. And first thing you know, you'll begin to win that warfare. Ain't God good? No more curse. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Their foreheads. What do you mean? Like branded on your head? Oh, don't go literal on me, natural on me. No, it means to think on him. He comes in from a long trip, and they hadn't been together for a while. And after things get kind of settled down, she looks at him and she said, did you think about me? And he better say yes, and it better be convincingly too. Yes, you are always on my mind. That's what it means to have his name in your forehead. And he walks with me. And he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And if you get to the place where you're drawn off into carnal religion and you begin to say to Jesus, well, I know you think that in Jerusalem is where people ought to worship, but we say and our prophets say in this mountain here in Samaria is the place men ought to worship. Gently, kindly, Lovingly, the husband takes her hand and say, My dear one, there comes a time and now is when neither in this mountain or in Jerusalem shall anybody worship God. Begins to lead you out of carnal religion. Belie begins to lead you out of conformed, sustained, theological truths. And bring you to the consciousness of God. And he says, I want you to know that. No more this mountain or your mountain. It doesn't matter. Because I want you to understand that now that I am come, the whole concept of place changes. He said, because... Now, they that worship him shall not worship him in Samaria or Jerusalem, but in spirit and in truth. What? That changes everything. Well, that's how it's supposed to be. It's the beast that has seven heads and seven names of blasphemy. It's religion that has blasphemous names. Dare I say any of them? Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian or Catholic? You going to throw me out? Christ puts one name in your head, and that is the name of Jesus. And it's no more longitude and latitude, time and place. It's now condition of the spirit. How am I going to go from time and place, this is where men say we ought to worship, to spirit and truth? Jesus said, because that's who my father seeks. For my father seeketh such to worship him. And all of a sudden, water pots and our thirst doesn't seem to be the issue anymore. And we don't really have, at least it's not in my Bible, 
it written down that Jesus ever got a swallow of water from that woman. And she goes tearing off into the city and she tells them, come see a man that told me all that ever I did. What he's done is open up himself to her and doing that, he opens up herself to her. You won't ever really know who you are until you come to know who God is. When we come to the awareness of God's glory, we see where we fit into the scheme of that glory, and it suddenly becomes real to us who we are and what our purpose is and how wonderful it is to be caught up in the name of Jesus and be incorporated as members of his body. God is so good. She forgot her water because Jesus said, if you'd just ask me, I got some water that you don't know anything about. I don't see any canteens. I don't see any water. You, you're not carrying anything. You ain't even got a camel to pack some skins of water on. No. He said, I'd give you water that would flow to eternal life, and you shall never thirst again. Ain't God good? Y'all, like I said this morning, you can hold up your cups if you want to. Here's my cup, Lord. I appreciate that. I'm glad you do. I used to do that, but now I jump in the river and drink my way out. There is a river. Didn't you? We sung that, didn't we? I know. Here's my cup, Lord. I hold it up, Lord. Feed me till I want no more. I ain't never got to that place. I'm always wanting more. It's a river. It's not a skin of water like Ishmael had that gave out on him. It's a river. It's wells of living waters that can't be stopped up. It's the vastness and glory of God. And dear soul, listen, in Genesis chapter 2, what do the waters that go outside the garden bring you to? It said, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted. From thence it was parted and became four heads. It didn't say four rivers, but that's what it is. It became four heads. Who is the blessed man? He says, a tree planted by the Rivers of water. That's the blessed man. So the Lord said, I'm going to diffuse this and fix it so that I can diffuse myself to you and you'll be able to receive it. We had some plumbing problems a couple of years ago and found a man that we could trust and did a good job and he came and put a gauge on our water pipes. It was too forceful, and he gauged it down. God diffused himself into four different directions and fixed it so that when it comes out, and that's not going to knock you down. Because he leadeth us beside the Ain't that good? That's worth coming to church for, just to hear that. He leadeth me beside still waters. How does he speak to me? Through the still, small voice. What does God have to do to get to you that he hasn't done? Nothing. He's, all, he's always prepared for you. And he diffuses himself through these four heads and he himself is the head the book of Ephesians tells us the head of the church which is Christ but now he's going to have four different heads and they are going to manifest himself to the world 
And he gives you their names. I know the four heads that God has given me that helped me so much and has brought me along and been such a blessing to me. I, I, I've, I've seen the four heads. They, if I can find them. The first is like a lion. Matthew, the head, reveals the kingdom of God to me. The second, like a calf. Mark, revealing the suffering servant to me. The third has the face of a man, showing me Christ's humanity. And the fourth, the third was Luke, the physician, representing mankind. And the fourth beast, not an eagle, but a flying eagle. John soars up in the heavenlies and talks to you about things that the other three don't talk about. And brings up stuff that reveals the greatness and the glory of Almighty God. And through those four heads, the Lord has manifested himself to us. And he said, the Holy Spirit comes, he will bring to your attention the things that I have said to you. And I have wondered how they get the details so accurate when it was like years since Christ had been taken up from the earth. And yet they listed things out so explicitly. And he said, the Holy Ghost will help you remember those things. And I began to read those things and I began to see that the four heads to me were the four gospels that Jesus brought and manifest to all the earth. Let's go back to the year 100. Let's find a guy, say in Rome, that's a Christian. How did you come to know Christ through the gospel? Speed on up, let's go up to 600 and find somebody. How did you come to know Christ by the gospel? We don't need to keep doing that, do we? It is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first, got them, now to the Gentile. And we have God manifesting himself and diffusing himself through the four gospels and giving us understanding of the person of God himself. How do you know God? Through the power of God unto salvation, which is the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto, unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. It is a mystery. It stems from the same river, but it's diffused out into the four corners of the earth so that we might come to drink there and live there and thrive there and come to understand God there and have our thirst quenched there. And the awareness of God's glory and the awareness of who we are and why we're here and what the purpose is is diffused by God when he comes outside the garden. And now he can say, as far as the name goes, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Isn't that good? I know God. You do what? You dare say that? Yeah, it gets to me. But I can say it. I know God. How do you know God? Because he first knew me. And he wasn't pleased to stay inside the Garden of Eden and just water the garden with, with no name and be a singular river, but he came out. The leper was told that if anybody came close to you without leprosy, you was to cover your mouth and to cry, unclean, unclean. 
And he could not come home, and he could not come into the city. He had to stay outside. He had to stay without the walls. And the only hope he had as he sat there in the dust and in his disease and in his hopelessness was that one day the, the wall, the city gate would open up and the high priest would come out. And one day he did. And I cried, unclean, unclean. She was writing the song, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. And I was crying, Touch me not, O holy Savior, lest I make you unclean. And I come to find out you can't make Jesus unclean. God made him to be sin for us, and it didn't stick. Ain't that good? He came to where we were and touched us. Any Israelite touching a leper themselves were unclean. But this ain't just any Israelite. This is God Almighty. And he rises up with healing in his wings. He touched me and made me whole. Ain't that good? Since I met this blessed Savior. Ain't that good? I ain't talking about the singing. I'm talking about the, the testimony of it. Since he came and made me whole, I'm never going to cease to praise him. I don't know about shouting, but, you know, I'm going to keep it going while eternity rolls. He touched me. How'd you get here? He touched me. How'd you ever get enough currency that God would receive on behalf of your debt to pay off your debt and come here? He paid for the dead. He diffused himself in coming out of the garden into four heads. And guess what happened after the four heads were revealed? It says in verse 11 of Genesis 2, the name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The water will take you to the gold. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that are to try you as though some strange things happened unto you. But it says, when you are tried, God will leave you in the fire until you come forth as gold. And they said they put the gold in there seven times. Because each time they could scoop off a little bit of the scum on top until there was none to scoop off. And the gold that was tried seven times and purified seven times, the way they knew that it was pure was that they could see their face in it. Almighty God, before the foundation of the world, found complete satisfaction in the relationship of the Father and the Son, he was daily his delight, but not without the elect, because the elect were in Christ from before the foundation of the world. They were not there literally. Adam hadn't been invented. Eve's womb had not been started yet. But there was a consciousness of God, of all of his elect, in his Son, and there we were. And God said, let's get this thing started. He said, what are you going to do to start? He said, well, I'm going to begin. In beginning, or to begin, God created 
the heaven and the and here we go. And it comes on down. And God, in the essence of his glory, communicating within himself in that perfectly, how do you say it, illuminated egg in whom there is no darkness at all, he penetrates outside that egg. That's where sexuality came from. Penetrating into the darkness and depositing your egg, your sperm, your seed into it, into the darkness and it impregnates the darkness and forthwith comes that which looks like yourself. God penetrated the darkness with the glory of himself and went out four ways from the city and the garden and impregnated nothingness with himself. And Galatians 3.16 said the seed was Christ and we were all birthed by Christ. And the next thing you see, the one river, nameless, comes into four rivers that are named, headed in four different directions. But what they lead you to is the gold. And God would bring you into his presence Seeing himself in you. I read you Hebrews 1 3 this morning, the express image of his person. He is the reality of the glory of God. And then it says, You have been predestinated to be conformed to the image of his dear son and the image of his dear son is the image of God's glory. So God penetrated the walls of that garden. You're a garden enclosed. The brother read you in the book of the Revelation they shall go no more out. She's enclosed. But she's not by herself. The life-givingness of the singular, nameless river comes and impregnates her with the fourfold manifestation of God. And it matters not whether she comes from the north, the south, the east, or the west. God shall out of every, every kindred and nation and people and tongue bring somebody in. And he's going to touch them with that water that is the essence of God. And they shall come forth as gold. This is killing me. Thank God. Hmm. Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the book of Matthew. He is, my, in Mark, he's the calf, the sacrificial lamb. In Luke, we see his humanity as the son of man. And in John, we see him as the flying eagle. The word was God and dwelt among us. I don't have a concept of being saved, preserved, kept by the emergency vehicle showing up or the Red Cross jumping out and giving me oxygen and pumping my chest and saving me. God Almighty came to where I was and he touched me and he made me whole. Guilty, vile, and helpless me, spotless lamb of God was he. Full atonement. Can it be? Oh, Lord. Look what you had to do. 
You know, I, I, I think I'm about old as dirt now. I don't know how old I am, but anyhow. You know what a good day is? A day of nothing. No appointments, no door, no doorbells ring. I don't answer the phone no more. Can't hear, can't hear it anyhow. <laughs> Day of quietness and peace, and that's when, where the Lord has brought us. The quietness, and the Bible said there was silence in heaven for the space of about a half an hour. You know why he did that in Revelation 8? He said, shut up and sit down, you angels. Everybody be quiet up here. Quit singing holy, holy, holy. Silence in heaven. What's wrong with him? Nothing. He wants to hear Brenda Quick's prayers about her eyes. He wants to hear Claudette's prayer about having to rent a car to go take a son to a, a, to a appointment. He's silent. Nathan and driving over, praying to God every time he hears the airplane go over, that the darling of his soul be kept safe. You mean there's something more than holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty? There's something God wants to hear better than that? Yeah. He, Lord, let me say it. I can't stand it. He wants to hear from you.